Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Everyone that is here with us in person and those of you that are online, we say welcome to the mix. My name is Marcus Singlin. I'm the lead pastor here of this church, and I am very, very grateful uh, that we get this opportunity this morning to come together to hear what the Lord is saying to us. Can I tell you that the Lord has been speaking throughout this uh, experience. The Lord has been manifesting his presence in this moment. And I, I want you to know that God has something for you. Uh, if you're in expectation, I always say this, your expectation level is where God will meet you on today. And I believe that to be so. If you're expecting something, then God has a level to meet you at today. And what I do believe is that when we're expecting, it means that we still have a level of hope that God can do what he says he will do. And so as we're hoping today, even with things not being the way they want to be or we, we're not seeing the results of what we want to see maybe manifested in our lives right now, I want to let you know that God has better and more than you could imagine or think. And it's all waiting for you today. And so we're excited about that. I, I want us to jump into our scripture. So uh, let's pull out our notepads. Let's pull out our, our, our phones and our laptops and our books and our Bibles. Anything that we have, we're going to uh, hear what the voice of the Lord is saying. And we're going to uh, write that down because what God is speaking is not just for today, but it's for the week ahead. He's speaking into our lives and I believe in that to be so on today. And I'm excited. We say here at The Mix that note takers are what? World changers. So just tell somebody beside you, remind them real quick, you are a world changer. Tell somebody else on the other side, you are a world changer. Can you tell somebody that's your third choice? Say, sorry, you're my third choice. But you are a world changer. In Jesus' name. I just want to first be able to take the opportunity um, to say thank you to everyone that helped us with trunk or treat on yesterday. It was such a blessing and such a phenomenal opportunity to be able to uh, be in the community. We believe that uh, being the hands and feet of Jesus, we are never limited to the four walls of this building, but we are called to go beyond this building to see lives change and to see people come to know Jesus. So it's so great to see so many children and so many people be a part of a moment of uh, sharing uh, candy. Some people's kids are hyped up. So I pray um, for them right now in Jesus name that they did go to sleep. But uh, we were excited to see uh, so many lives impacted, so many families come out, so many people celebrating, not Halloween, but celebrating that God still loves us. And so we give an alternative to Halloween. We give an opportunity for people to come around, people like themselves, and to be able to just share in the moment of dressing up in uh, their favorite costumes. I I, I was a part, and, um, and uh, I had a little grievance because... Uh, they were judging the best cars. And um, my car, to me, um, and to, I believe, many others, and God himself, I believe, uh, was the best car there. But the problem was is that I was not entered in into the contest. So um, my greatness was not, um, was not recognized like it should have been. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to some leaders on that a little bit later. Um, but if you can jump into the word of God, we're going to be in John chapter 6. John chapter 6 on today. And uh, we're still in our series called Lessons. Lessons. And I want to talk about when things get hard. There's an opportunity for you to react. There's an opportunity for uh, you to accept there's an opportunity for God to move. And so I believe that the scripture that we're going to pull some pieces out of in John chapter 6 is going to help us understand a little bit letter, more about what God is speaking as John is writing. John writes, and so Jesus said to them, meaning those that were of uh, the religious leaders and to those around him, he said, 
Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Sounds like a Halloween story if you want to really start off. It, it's a great way to start off a, a great story on uh, what this world says is Halloween. But I think we'll get the essence as we keep going. It says, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food. And my blood is true drink. We're going to jump to verse 60 and read 60 and 61. It says, and when many of the disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it, let alone do it? Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Jumping to verse 66, and we're going to read the 69, it says, And after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go as well? Simon Peter, always being the smoke spokesman for the crowd, speaks up and says, Lord, to be honest at this point, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. I'm going to do for a title that you can write down this morning. It's harder than it looks. It's harder than it looks. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we are praying that your word would enter into our hearts, into our ears. But it would not just enter in, but it would be the transformative that's needed to change us from who we used to be to who you've called for us to be. For we love you, we honor, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. 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 Thank you so much, musicians. I so appreciate it. I say this weekly, but I want to make sure that this is known. We appreciate all of our dream team, our volunteers that are part of the mix. Can we celebrate those that are part of our dream team and everything they do? I think it's so important. I believe this. A lot of times we're able to explain things in life that we don't often have the ability to live out. I think in many a times in life we have information for things that we know make sense. But how many of you know just because you know it doesn't mean you know how to do it? I think a lot of times we can tell people uh, good advice. We have good stories to give individuals. We, we have intelligence to know that if we go down this road, there's a possibility that these things could happen. But the problem is, is it's much easier to tell people than it is to actually do it ourselves. According to Google, all of us are geniuses. But when it, comes, when it comes to information, all of us are looking it up to pass it on. But none of us really know how we got the information. Matter of fact, we're, we've trusted so much. I've said this before in Google that we believe that there are no lies on the Internet. And we place ourselves in such a place that we will Google something, repeat it. And when challenged, we will need to go back to Google to find out how to challenge what has been challenged to us. Because we know the information, but we don't know the information. It's an idea and a perspective to understand that what's happening in our today in society is that we're gathering more information than we have the ability to apply. 
We're gathering information to let people know what to do. We, we, we've all, I've always said this. I find this very, very funny that we, we, we've, we've got uh, single people um, that are giving advice to married people. And we've got married people who haven't been single in a long time trying to tell single people uh, how to live their life. And, and we have uh, uh, people who are, are broke trying to give money advice to people who have money. And, 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 and we just have a, a difference of opinion and information because, again, everyone has access to the information, but not everyone knows how to apply it to their lives. And I think that if we could really be honest when we're teaching and telling and, and informing and directing people, if, if we could really understand, those of you that are online, I know you're understanding this with me, is that it's so much easier to be a part of the delivery than it is to be a part of hearing it and what we find ourselves in the place is that if we really went to YouTube when he says just pull out the spark plug underneath the right converter and pull it out from the back all you need is just two inches to slide it to the left once you pull it out you put it back in on the right hand side instead of the left hand because the engine and you're sitting there saying it's easy to you it's not easy to me and if we could be really honest we would tell people that what you're explaining is easy for you because you've done it or you've been in it but the problem is is that it's not as easy for me to be able to receive or live out my, my mom is one whom I, I, I highly respect for her ability to be so consistent and disciplined in working out. And oftentimes she will have a conversation with me about the importance of health and all the things that I need to avoid and, and the things that I don't need to eat. She tells me about how the quality of meat that I eat is so important. Let it be grass fed and make sure that, that, that it's, it goes in your system properly and that it digests you can't have too much of that it'll overly put you in a place here and I said mom it, it, it sounds great but the problem is is that I don't know if the whopper is from a grass-fed cow I, I don't know and when I'm in the drive through I don't care For her, it's easier because it's a part of what she does. For me, it's harder because I just want something to eat. (laughs) Can I tell you oftentimes in life, if we could be honest, that when we come into a place like this or you're watching from online and I begin to talk to you about God's uh, plan and purpose for our life it sounds amazing I want that I want to know where I'm going I want to live well I want to fulfill the call that he has over my life and then we start kind of giving you the direction of what God's word says and I think we become like the disciples where we say to ourselves this teaching is hard to take if we really be honest, it, it, it's easier said than done. It, it looks much easier than that. All you got to do is just stop going over there and everything will be all right. Pastor, you don't know my situation. <laughs> and what I tend to think is, is that it's easier to explain how to live for God than it is actually to live for him. Can I get an amen in the house? Now, some of y'all holy, I've been doing it well. I don't know about you, but I've been pretty perfect at it, and I don't know what your problem is. I'm here today to let you know I'm not in that crowd. I'm in the crowd of people that on Monday is just as a struggle for me to get up as it is for you. I come to a church to work, but it doesn't make it any easier. And I'm here today to let you know that it's always easier than what it really is. 
We're in a place where I'm, I'm, I'm defining and understanding that as I'm relating this gospel, this good news, I, I need to be as honest as possible to let you know in the moments that it sounds good to where you're going to get to, but the process is going to be harder than what is really being explained. But here's the problem. I cannot hold back on telling you the truth in order to recruit you in and you get in and you jump right back out. I think it's important that I give to you what God's word is saying. And, and, and so this is a moment in John chapter 6 that's happening. Jesus is in the synagogue and he's talking and he's referring and letting them know that he is the living bread. If you eat of him, if you drink of him, he will be everything you need. But Jesus goes a little too far. Goes a little bit too far. And people don't like it. Mm -mm. And it comes through and it and, 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 and John is writing this. Can I, can I tell you really how this looks? Jesus has had a great following. There are people that are connected to his ministry. They have seen him heal the eyes of the blind. They have seen him heal those that were sick. They have seen him uh, 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 be at a wedding and turn it up and make it lit. He, he took some water, some, some unfiltered water and he turned it into wine you can imagine the disciples around him are like my god we are following the christ this has to be the christ They're following him and they're saying, man, last night we got turned up. The party was going crazy. All of a sudden they lost wine. Jesus said, keep the party going. We kept it rolling. Matter of fact, we just got in. We had a good time. People know our names. We're walking around. Folk know who we are. Peter was like, listen, let me tell you something. When I met Jesus, he brought a catch of fish over so much that I could not even contain it in the boat that I had. He's like, you know this Jesus. And Jesus says, I know you know me. I know you know of my blessings. I know you've heard of me. But now is the time to test. Do you really love me? It's all good to say, yeah, yeah, you know, I follow God. You know, I'm a God follower. I'm on that good energy with Jesus, you know. But it's like, no, I need to really test. Are you really a follower of me? Or are you following me for the fishes and the loaves? Are you following me for the miracles? Are you following me because I made a way out of no way? Or are you following me because... I am he who is the bread of life. I am he who is the drink that you are to take in. Are you following me? And so Jesus now begins to divide his followers up with one statement that shakes everything. If you're truly my disciples, truly, truly, said it twice, truly, 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 I want to let you know, if you are my disciple, you're going to eat my flesh and drink my blood. All right, God bless you all. Have a great day. <laughs> the disciples, not just the 12, but the other followers. <laughs> the Bible says they didn't like that. No, 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 no. It says, when it, many of his disciples heard it, it was verse 60, it says they said, this is a hard saying. Anybody ever had a hard saying that you was like, ah, I can't get with that? Because what it's going to do is change and alter my life. And it's going to make me have to do things that I don't want to do because how I want to live is I want to love God, have his blessings, but do what I like to do. 
Just tell your neighbor real quick, just be honest. We want our cake and eat it too, right? I want the blessings of God. I want the hand of God. I want the favor of God. I want the purpose of God. I want God to bless my home, God to give me a house. I want, I want God to give me a car. I want God to give me a mate. I want God to, to bless me in school. I want God to do everything he can possibly do. But I need some contingencies to this whole Bible thing. I want purpose. I want a plan. I want to live a blessed life. I want to have a, a generosity spirit and heart to be able to do but. I, I need to alter some things a little bit. So, so, so if, 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 we could, if we could go real quick, Jesus, and just look at some things because this is a hard saying that you're asking of me. And so I just want to make sure that I can still make it to heaven while borderline serving you. Because if I can get away with it, I will. So real quick, praying. How, how much of that do I really have to do? I know you said seek me and, 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 and the kingdom and then all these other things. But can we get some things with some prayer? And then once we get enough, I'll come back and pray a little bit more to get more things with a little bit more prayer. Can we amend the whole every morning waking up praying thing? I'm not really a morning person. And when you're telling me to seek you, this is a hard saying. Now, when you say don't lie. Do you mean like on everything <laughs> or like just some things like like taxes? We good? We good, right? As far as the taxes and that, and that stuff, it's, we good because I'm going to write off everything I can, even stuff that don't even make sense. I got as long as I got a receipt for it, God, that's we. We in it, right? We, it's, it's good, right? What, what about dating? You tell us that sex before marriage is bad. Got it. What's the definition of sex? If, if I could get a hair more of clarity on how far is too far, then I know like where my boundaries are and how far I can go without a depriving me, but displeasing you. Because if you're saying no sex, no nothing, you're saying you actually want me to be single and live that way? I don't know, man. That's hard. Ain't nobody else out here doing it, God. That's kind of hard. That's a hard saying. You, you, you want me to get married and stay with one person? Like the rest of my life? That's a hard saying. I can't have a little something on the side. I, I can't have a work wife. I can't have a work husband. We, 
We can't do a little something like on a, you know, just not often. Because I'm not really getting it at home like I want. So I'm, I'm just interested. I, I'm a, I have needs. And what you're trying to tell me is it's not okay to fulfill the needs when I'm walking with you until I'm in order with you. This is a hard saying. How are we going to know one another if we don't live together? Got quiet. Hey, Mike, turn my mic up. Something wrong with my mic. Turn my mic up, Mike. Something wrong with my mic. Hello? Hello? So you saying we can't live everything out as a married couple but not be willing to make the commitment? This is a hard saying. Everybody else does it. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. I'm not doing that. Church is crazy. They antiquated. They don't know what it's like out here. You got to meet the need. You got to you got to be all right with where I am and 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 be accepting where I am because because that's the way it is and and Jesus loves me. This I know. But that good old Bible tells me so. And I preach it. And you don't write that note. Mm, no, no, no. Skip that. We skip the note that pertains to us. Because that saying is too hard. Here's what I like about the ending of the scripture. Is that Jesus ends so loving. As he ends this saying, he gets to the point where he's like, okay, I know I brought down the mode. Let me bring the energy back up in the room. Because I don't want the energy to be off. He says, okay, let me hype y'all back up so that y'all can follow me. Let me give you something that'll make you feel good. And one of you will betray me. Jesus, did you pray this morning? Because you seem awful cranky. When you look through the rest of it, Jesus never explains what he means. He just says it. And says, now to you 12, whom I specifically called, do you want to go too? Simon Peter says, listen, I done moved out my house. I ain't got no job. I d- Where else are we going to go? See, when you haven't given God everything, you have other options waiting. So when it doesn't work out the way you want it, you say, well, I'll go over here to what I had in the corner anyway. If this doesn't work the way that I like, because the saying is to... Hard. Can I tell you that as John is probably writing this, he's like, I remember that. I thought Jesus was tripping too. I ain't say it in front of him. But I thought he was tripping too. 
It's because the Bible says that Jesus knew what was happening with inside of them. And so he turned to his disciples to say, are you gone too? And Peter says, Lord, you only have these words of eternal life. Where are we going to go? My question to you is when God challenges your life, where do you go? Who do you call? What house do you go over? What people do you find to accept your lifestyle so that you feel okay about making sure it's hard for you? It was hard for me. Man, let's get out of here. Because if I can find people that are in agreement with my stuff, then I feel good when I leave out. Because I'm saying it was hard for all of us. can none of us do it, so we might as well all bail. But there's got to be a few of us. There's got to be a few of us that have made a decision and made a call and made a stand and said to the Lord, where shall we go? When things are going perfectly and we're home by ourselves and we're looking, trying to figure out why it looks like we don't have any friends and we're ready to compromise, you need to say to yourself, where are you going to go? When the doctor gives you a report that goes totally against what you want to hear and how you feel in this moment and it says things don't look the best and you think about all this time I've been serving him, I've been coming, I've been giving, I've been giving my time to God. But then you got to look at yourself and say, where are you going to go? For you, O Lord, have the words of eternal life. Where are you going to go? Who are you going to flee to? Who's going to agree with you so that you stay where you are? You may have gotten out of the world, but the world is still in you. Where are you going to go? People are trying to tell you, not because they want to be in your business, they're telling you because they're trying to keep you from going back into that broken place. Where are you going to go? We saw this before. We've seen them go down that road. We know what the end result is going to be for you. Where are you going to go? The disciples got in the side and said, what the heck are you going to do? I don't know. I feel like walking. What do you feel like doing? I think we should stay because if we stay, we got a possibility to get somewhere we haven't seen before. But if we go and leave like the rest of them, we're going to mess up every chance we got. So you need to get with a few people who made a call and the decision to follow God and say, where are you going? I'm not going nowhere. So guess what? I'm not going nowhere. Because you, O oh Lord, have the words of eternal life. And what happens is when you've made a stand, people's exaggerated post of how well their life looks doesn't affect you because you've taken a stand. It looks nice on you, but I ain't got nowhere to go. See, eventually, the church will get to a place where they don't have to come to church. They want to come to church. And you'll be like, why you keep going? He called me. I actually don't even want to go. Can I be honest with a couple of y'all? When COVID hit, it shocked me. But then I moved from shocked to like, well, I probably haven't had a Sunday off in over 40 years and nine months because I'm 40. But I've been going to church since I was one month. I ain't had a break on a Sunday in 40 years and nine months. And now you're telling me we taping four weeks and we off three? Oh, this ain't bad. This ain't bad. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not mad at it. I'm not mad at it at all. But there was something about the call. 
makes a difference. It's not a job. It's not a requirement. It's not a have to. It's a call. God called me. So I feel uncomfortable when I'm not doing his will. I feel uncomfortable when I'm not walking in his purpose. I feel uncomfortable when I'm not completing what he said over my life. It may be okay for you, but it's not okay for me because I'm living my life in a calling. You're living your life day by day trying to figure out what's the next thing you're going to do. I've already seen the next thing I'm going to do. I'm just trusting God to get there. So there's a difference in what I'm forced to do and what I'm called to do. When you finally recognize your call, you stop looking to your emotions to be your guidance. I ain't f- they lucky I came this morning. You know I want to say that every Sunday. You're lucky I came this Sunday. Because eventually your walk is going to test you. So all the good things that you say and all the Bible reading that you do and all the prayers that you're offering, they challenge you. And when you're when you're constantly at a place where you're diving for comfort. God says, you're not fit to follow me. Lord, I got to bury the dead. You know, I got something this weekend. And I don't know if I'll be able to make it. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You stay where you're at. I got I to gotta go bury. Let the dead bury the dead. Foxes have no holes and, and, and birds have nests, but the son of man has no way to lay his head. I get what you don't have. I get where you, not, you aren't. But here's what I want to let you know. Your follow is not about that. Let me tell you what your follow is about. Point number one, your follow is about obedience. Here's what I love about our world. We will take things that are meant for our growth and we will bring a negative connotation to it. I say obedience. You say they trying to oppress me. They trying to control me. That's what that church trying. They trying to control my relationships. Pass up there want to want to tell me what to do. No, I don't. No, I don't. I just want to give you the word of God so that you can see your life change from where it is to where God's called it to be. If you don't want to do it, then don't do it. It's saying it's too hard. Got it. And the results will be even harder. Point number one, obedience is not my enemy. Obedience is not there to oppress me or offend me. It's there to grow me. Stop thinking that you're supposed to be in a culture where no one can tell you anything because you know everything, but you're nowhere where you want to be. It makes no sense to the context of the way that you're living your life. Jesus says to them, eat my flesh and drink my blood. He's saying, you've got to trust me enough that I haven't called you into a work of cannibalism. Because if that's the level you're thinking at, you don't know me. Any of his disciples would have known Jesus ain't talking about some literal flesh. Now, I may not understand why he's saying it now, and I may not understand the reason why, but what I do get is I know my God enough. And I know him enough that whatever he's saying is not to keep me from, but it is to include me in the true plan that he has for my life. 
God's trying to kill my joy. He's not trying to kill your joy. He's trying to give you joy because you haven't had it in so long. And you need the stimulation of the dopamine hit from your broken ways. Yep. You need that dopamine release from what you just watched. You need that dopamine release from what you just touched. You need that dopamine release from what you were just saying. So he said, listen, what I need you to understand is I'm trying to get you beyond the pleasures for a season to move you into a place where you can have joy unspeakable and full of glory. But some of us have found ourselves in the place where we've been self-medicating with our broken natures. So we don't know what joy looks like without that on the side. We don't know what peace looks like without this influencing it. Jesus eventually says, it is going to be hard. And you are going to have to choose. And you are going to have to make a decision. And you won't just be able to call me a higher power. But you will need to be able to speak my name. For it says in God's word, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. Eventually... What he's saying is you will come to recognize me specifically for who I am. I'm trying. And some of us have only learned obedience when it's beneficial to our flesh. The Lord said, walk over here, and I got a new car. I am gone, Lord. I got it. If it's going to get me what I want, if it's going to land me what I've been dreaming about, I'm there. But he's like, I need you to just be obedient and stay still. Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. No. If you're like me, you got a tad bit of ADHD, it's like, mm-mm. I need something. You're going to have to help me here. We're going to need something. You got to do something. Tell me what's next now. A little bit. A half. A share. You start getting desperate. Just a nibble, please. Please, Jesus. And the Lord's like, no, I'm trying to teach you obedience because obedience brings discipline. Some of us lack discipline in our lives to be able to carry out any of the promises that God has for us. So he's trying to build you to a place where your consistency is not a part of your check. It's a part of your character. I'll be there on time as long as they pay me. They don't pay me my money, Sabrina. I won't be there, all right? It's the idea that the way I operate always has contingencies placed upon it because it's not the measure of who I truly am. It is the measure of what I can get from what God can give me. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 15, 22, but Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord? Your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? It says, listen, Obedience is better than sacrifice. And submission is better than offering the fat of rams. What God is saying is you can keep your little offerings and you can keep your little gifts. Because I don't need them in your lack of obedience. So whatever you think you're doing for me, God is saying, I promise you, I have plenty more where you come from. For he told the people of God, if you don't praise me, the rocks will cry out. You know the kind of power our God has? 
Y'all up there looking at that like, that's just crazy. You telling me God can make rocks cry out? Yes! So the obedience is not this enemy that comes to confine you. It is something that God has placed so that you can understand truly what real love is. But the scripture lets us know, Jesus said, if you love me, then you'll keep my commandments. The result of loving me more is the result of obedience. Point number two. What I need you to know is restraint is not a weakness. Lord knows I could, I could definitely use some prayer on this one. I was driving from D.C. yesterday. Y'all know my driving stories. I was going at a pretty decent speed. I won't report that speed on camera right now. So I could get home and make sure I go over this message with you. But someone's speed was greater than my speed. And I didn't see them come, and, 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 and they, they, they came so quickly that they got in front of me. I said, oh, oh, no, you don't. That's, that's not what you will do here. So for a couple of miles, we begin the Indy 5000. Everybody's life is on the line. My life, my wife's life, she sleeps, she don't know. She wakes up like, what is going on? I said, nothing, nothing, nothing. I haven't been speed chasing anybody for the last two miles. No. Here's what I know about restraint. Is that restraint keeps you from a life of regret. Restraint keeps you from a life of regret where you always are talking about, if I hadn't, then I wouldn't. Restraint says, I'm not going to, so I don't have to worry about. And when I can find restraint in my life, I find a need, those of you that are online, an ability to be able to wait for when God opens the door and to not walk in even when there's a door open, but God didn't open it for me. I am not basing my life upon my desires and what I have to have. I'm saying to God, when the timing is right, I will follow you. That's why scripture says, be not weary and well-doing. For in due season, ye shall reap a harvest if you faint not. But it's in due season. Some of us have never looked for a season and we just operate out of our needs and our desires. I'm lonely. Let me find someone to not make me lonely. I'm hungry. Let me find something that will feed me, no matter what it does to me later. Let me operate in a way that I always know that I'm going to regret the decision that I'm making now for the future I will see coming. And some of you, I'm going to give you this word right now. God says, I am giving this word to you so you can stop now before it gets any worse. Second Corinthians 12 and 9 says, but he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for, somebody say me. My loving kindness and my mercy are more than enough. Always available, regardless of the situation, for my power 
is being perfected and is completed and shows itself more effectively in your weakness. I like this part. Therefore, I will all the more gladly boast in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may completely, somebody say completely, completely. enfold me and may dwell in me. What are you saying? I'm saying I'm willing to admit my weakness with the expectation that God's power will inhabit me to be able to do greater than what I have the ability to do of myself. I will not boast in my weakness to let people know that this is what I do and this is how I do it. Hey, this is what I do. This is where I'm at. With no anticipation of change in your life. God's not interested in you boasting about your brokenness for the sake of staying where you are. He's interested in you boasting about your weakness so that you may be empowered through the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to overcome that in which you don't have the power to do of yourself. My weakness is what? I can be lazy. So, Lord, I need you to empower me with the mindset to work beyond my comfort level. Even if that was taught to me, then you just don't do enough. You stay balanced in your life. You haven't been balanced in all the rest of your life. So I'm very interested. Why now are you trying? We love balance with God. We don't mind imbalance with the world. I didn't get no rest tonight. I was out late. And we brag about it. I was out, tore up, come in like, what's wrong with you? It was crazy last night. I was out with Jesus. We was at this party. It started to get dry. He heard about it, turned the water into wine. Man, we ain't get until late. It was crazy. Then the Bible says, and Jesus gets up and prays to the Father early in the morning so that he can do the work that he's called him to do. You've been boasting and bragging about how busy you are without it actually having any impact on your life. You're busy to be busy, not busy to fulfill purpose. I'm tired. That's your tired. I'm worn out. That's because you're in overtime and haven't learned how to manage what you have. You don't like that. Yeah, no, mm mm, Pastor, you're not gonna do that. You're not gonna take away, mm mm, not my money. Don't play with my money, Pastor. <laughs> now that's a hard saying now. God's like, I've given you everything you need to do all that I've called you to do to get you to where I, I'm calling you to be. If you would trust me enough, then you would see the response of my word in your life bringing to effect that which it's supposed to do. My last point, point number three, surrender is not losing, but gaining. We think surrender, we've, we've created in our society this idea that surrender is this, this place of I've lost. And it's truly the place of where you've gained. The scripture lets us know in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If you truly want to follow me, you should at once completely reject and disown your old life. And you must be willing to share my cross and experience it as your own as you continually surrender to my ways. I want to let you know honestly today that it's not going to be easy. And it's harder than what it looks. 
You can't manipulate it into effect. You can't just speak it into effect. We hear the scripture, speak those things that are not as though they were. And we're like, I can just speak it, but I don't have to do anything. And God says, no, faith without works is dead. So the lack of your action speaks to the lack of your faith. For you can say you have faith, but in order to truly justify your faith, there must be works to follow it. The Lord is saying, do you believe me enough that what I've spoken to you, even though it's hard, you know that what I'm saying for you is for your good. Do you trust the moment of what I'm asking you to do and to walk in faith is not going to always be an inspirational moment. And it's not always going to be an energy filled space where you feel motivated. Sometimes you will feel at your lowest point, but Jesus says, my strength will be made perfect in your weakness. Am I still in compliance when I'm weak? Yes. Because if you surrender to me, I'll let you know that I'm still with you. He said, lo, I'll be with you always, even until the end of the ages. I am with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. When your mother and your father forsake you, then the Lord will take you up. I'm here today to let you know, God will never fail you. I want to read this last scripture to you in Matthew 16 and 26, and it says this. For even if you were to gain all the wealth and power of this world at the cost of your own life, what good would that be? And what would be more valuable to you than your own soul? My question today is, how much do you value yourself and your soul? Because if you value you, then you'll let God make you brand new. Let's thank God for the word today. Come on, can we celebrate him? I believe that God's called us to this moment to, to pray. And I want to pray for you in this place that you not be offended, but that you could receive the hard saying in love. That everything that Jesus has for you is for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we declare and speak in this place that God, we are no longer running from these moments of your blessing, these moments of your direction, these moments of following after you. But what I speak today is God, that we would build disciples, that whatever you say, whatever you call us to, we will follow you. In Jesus' name, we say amen.